Okay, here's a question from uh, chapter 6.5, and it's really the crux of everything you need to learn, or one of the main things you really need to learn from chapter 6, and it's the idea of the normal distribution and the fact that we can figure out the probability of something happening if we relate it to area under the curve. So here's our standard bell curve. All right. So not a great drawing, but you get the idea. Okay. Now, any situation you're given has a bell curve associated with it. And the beautiful thing about the central limit theorem is that we can always apply this principle to any sample. So in this particular sample, we have an average of 62.3, right, and a standard deviation of 1.8. So what that means is if we sampled over and over and over and over and over again, all of our samples would end up having an average of 62.3 and a standard deviation of 1.8. So one standard deviation over, right, if this was equal to exactly one standard deviation, then this mark on the graph would be 64.1, because it's just 62.3 plus 1.8. Okay, so what this question is asking is, so here's our bell curve. Again, apologies for the lack of drawing ability. They want to know what's the probability that somebody is between 61.7 and 62.7. Well, we know the average, right, is 62.3. So the 62.7 is somewhere right around here, 62.7, and 61.7 is somewhere over here. The accuracy of the placement of your line is not that important. Just being able to visualize what's going on. And we're looking for someone who is in between those heights, so aren't we looking for all this area? All right, so we're trying to figure out the area under the curve in between those two points. Well, we have a z-table. In fact, we can get this information really easily from calculators as well, but we have a z-table, and what the z-table tells us is that if we're a certain number of standard deviations in one direction or the other, i.e. z-scores, it gives us the amount of area under the curve. So if you have your z-table with you, open up your z-table right now, and just take a look at it. And let's let's look at one together. So, for instance, let's say, and I'll draw a picture over here. And let's say you uh, calculate and you get a Z score, right, for this part here, and you get a Z of um, let's say 0 0.72, right? So it's almost one full standard deviation above the mean. It's 0.72, right? 70% of a standard deviation. So that's a Z of 0.72. If you look in your table, table A2, the left-hand column represents the first part of the Z score. And on the top, that's the second digit. So if we want 0.72, you go down the table till you get to 0 0.7. Then you go across till you get to this 0 0.02. And you put those together, and it gives you 0.72. And that tells you from the table, 0.7642. Take a second and make sure you can find that same number in your table. Also pay attention to the, the top of the table where it has the picture, because the picture tells you that these numbers in the table represent the area to the left. Okay, So if you have a z-score of 0.72, you have basically 76% of the data values are to the left of that. So if the question was, what's the probability that you pick something at random and it had a z-score less than 0.72, your answer would be 76.42%. If the question was, what's the probability that it's above? Well, isn't above just 1 minus this, right? So you'd say, you know, it's roughly 24%. It's 23.58. Okay, so that's how the table works. So we want to know what's the probability that something is in between these two amounts, right? this area here. So we need to figure out the z-score for this and the z-score for this and look some things up in the table. All right, so how do we calculate a z-score? Well, that's pretty simple, too. We've got this nice little formula. In fact, we have two formulas in Chapter 6.
we have z equals x minus x bar all over s. We also have z equals x minus mu all over sigma. And then we have this other thing where they talk about um, sigma x equals sigma over the square root of n. Okay, what does all this stuff mean? <clears throat> well, this this first one, and uh, I'll see if I can highlight it for you. This is the the good one only because it's the one we're going to use more often than than the other because as you can see the only difference between those two is this one on top has an s and this one down here has a mu and a sigma right so x bar that's the average of our sample mu that's the average of our population s that's the standard deviation of our sample this little lowercase sigma standard deviation of our population and we almost never know the information from the population. We're almost always dealing with a sample. So that's why we end up dealing with this formula more than this bottom one. Can you see how they're the same though? I mean they really are the same formula. It's just when we're dealing with the sample we use this one and we're dealing with the population we use the one below. Okay, so what the heck does this thing mean? Well, this comes from the central limit theorem and it's this idea that if you sample over and over and over and over and over again you're going to get the average of your samples are going to approach the average of the true population. All this really means is if you have two different types of questions sometimes the standard deviation you use is the standard deviation you're given and sometimes you do kind of this little correction where you take the standard deviation and you divide by the square root of n where n is your sample size. And I'll give you an example and you can see when to use one and when to use the other and it's very simple. But for this case we have one woman is, is randomly selected and we want to know the probability that her weight is between those two. Well, we only use this correction when we take an entire sample and then we want to know what's the probability that that average of the sample does something. You know, the average of the sample is below this, the average of the sample is above that, the average of the sample is in between stuff. If we're talking about one person, then we just use the standard deviation we're given, whether it's sample or population. We only do this correction when we're talking about what happens in our entire sample rather than just one thing. But really, we're always using this correction if you want to think about it because in this particular case, in this part A, if we wanted to figure out our z-score, right? they tell us we have a mu, so we have to use the bottom one. right? So we're looking for a z-score of, let's do 62.7. 62.7 minus mu, and in this case mu is 62.3, and then divide by sigma 1.8 over the square root of our sample size. And if we're choosing one woman, what's our sample size? That's right, one, right? So technically you can always use this formula, it's just when you sample only one thing, n is one, and then the square root of 1 is just 1, and then when you do 1.8 divided by 1, you just get 1.8, right? So you just get right back to this situation where you just have a sigma. Okay, so put all this in your calculator, 62.7 minus 62.3 divided by 1.8, and I'll show you the steps. So we've got... Uh, Zero point four, right? That's six two point seven minus six two point three over one point eight. Slap that into your calculator. Point four divided by one point eight, and you get point two two two, and it keeps going on and on and on. Well, since our table only goes to two decimals, we always have to round to two decimals. So in this case, we just round to 0.22. And now we need to look up the z-score for 
look up 0.22 in our table and we get 0.5871 so this corresponds to 0.5871 in the table that means that if we go back up here and I'll do it in a color for you let's do uh, red right? this shape here represents 58.71% right, or 0.5871 of our data. So the probability that one person, uh, what is this, this height, is uh, below 62.7 inches tall is represented by all of this area under the curve and it ends up being 58.71% right, or a probability of 0.5871. Alright, so that was the first one. Now we can do the second z-score. The second z-score, same as the first, except now we're doing it with 61.7. So now we have uh, z equals 61.7 minus 62.3, again over 1.8. Uh, we put that into our calculator. 61.7 minus 62.3. Point three. I think I might have said 8.62.3. That's negative 0.6. Divide that by 1.8. Right, so this is negative 0.6 over 1.8, which equals negative 0.33. Again, repeating, we rounded two decimals, negative 0.33. Okay, look that up in our Z table which is now on the left page, because that's where our negatives are. And negative 0.33 is 0.3707. Okay, so this corresponds to point, what is it, 3707? Yeah, 3707. Okay, so we can look at that in a different color. Maybe we'll just highlight it in green. That means that this area here in green is this. Right? Because our table always gives us uh, area below, area below that point, right? So the probability that one person is shorter than 61.7 is 0.3707. And the probability that they're shorter than 62.7 is 58.71. So what's the probability that they're in between? Well, that's the area in between, right? The area from this point all the way down is 0.5871, and the area from this point all the way down is 0.3707. So how do we find the area in between? Well, it's simply the difference. 0.5871 minus 0 0.3707 0 0.5871 minus 0 0.3707 0 0.2163 So that's it for that question. That's the probability that someone is in between those two heights.